Hello and welcome. My name is Mark Horseman and I am a data evangelist with Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining the most recent webinar in the Dataversity monthly series, Elevating Enterprise Data Literacy with Dr. Wendy Lynch. This series is held the first Thursday of every month. Today, Wendy will discuss connecting data literacy to individual performance. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you would like to chat with us or chat with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And to note the Zoom defaults, the chat to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely switch it to chat with each other. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section. To find the chat and the Q&A panels, you'll find the icons for those features in the bottom middle of your screen. As always, we will send up a follow-up email within a couple business days containing the links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for the series, Dr. Wendy Lynch. For over 35 years, Wendy Lynch, PhD, has converted complex analytics into business value. At heart, she is a sense maker and translator, a consultant to numerous Fortune 100 companies. Her current work focuses on the application of big data solutions in human capital management. Through her roles in diverse work settings, including digital startups, century-old insurers, academic medical centers, consulting firms, healthcare providers, and the boardroom she became familiar with and fascinated by the unique language of each. She also became familiar with the diff difficult dynamic that often exists between business and analytic teams, preventing them from collaborating effectively. Those experiences led her to her true passion of promoting clear and meaningful conversations that produce mutual understanding and success. The result is her new book, Become an Analytic Translator and an Online Course. And with that, I will give the floor to Wendy to start the presentation. Hello and welcome, my good friend. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And I enjoy having you be my introducer today. So not that I don't enjoy Shannon as well, but um, thank you for that special treat. So today we are talking about the connection between individual performance and data literacy. And I will be proposing to you a slightly different way of thinking about promoting and introducing data to workers in an organization. Our goal is to make data meaningful. We want to have the employees care about what we are talking about. And I think that what you'll find is that we presume that they will be interested in certain things, but we don't necessarily capitalize on the things that might make it even more interesting and that they will care about even more. Our goal is to have fewer of the attendees in any kind of training that deals with data literacy feeling this way about what they are experiencing. And while it may be a little bit too ambitious to think that they will react like this, we can perhaps get a little closer to having people appreciate and gravitate toward data sets that we are helping them understand. I often hear leaders say that they need people to have high data literacy because what they really want is data-driven decisions. And I think what they mean is more that they want effective or valid or accurate or reliable data-driven decisions. Because my argument that I wanna start with today is that everybody in modern society already makes data-driven decisions. So for example, in modern society, Everybody relies upon and chooses what to believe, reacts to, debate, celebrates the results of different types of data every single day. We rely on all kinds 
of information that allow us to live our lives. For example, we rely on the Bureau of Standards that tells us that we can assume that if our clock and we are connecting it to something that is real, that our clock is correct and that we know what time it is. We know what temperature it is. We know what the date is. We know what a distance is. We know how fast we're going based on what that odometer tells us. We know how much money we have in our bank account. We know what a weight feels like. And this summer at the Olympic Games, we're going to believe that that 100 meter sprint is being clocked correctly. So we believe in all sorts of data all day, every day, because the standards are agreed upon. We make confident comparisons that today was colder, that our team did well, that I can make a choice about what I'm going to earn when I choose among different jobs, that my investments are going up or down, that my health is improving, that I'm making a purchase based on good information because data are collected and standards are applied consistently. And when we hear that something wasn't consistent, for example, during the women's NCAA basketball tournament, one of the places where they played, they had painted the three point line in the wrong place. And it was a bit of a scandal because we expect things to be consistent and standards being applied. We also make data-driven decisions every single day, multiple times a day, based on weather forecasts, based on traffic forecasts, based on financial changes, whether we are gonna make a certain purchase, and even based on astronomy. So we believe that there are data sets out there and we take them for granted. So when somebody says, oh, my people don't make data-driven decisions, I beg to differ. And we usually trust the sources that we are given. When it's these global, globally accepted types of information. In addition, we aren't just data consumers, we're data creators. With every time we interact with phones or websites, every time we communicate, every time we read something or, or report on something, every time we click, every time we log in every time our Fitbit measures how far we walked, every time we purchase something. We are data creators completely. And it's getting more and more and more that we leave data behind. We see in law enforcement, they're using records of where we were, what we said, who we talked to in order to build a case. We know that there are concerns about how companies are using the data that we leave behind. And our digital footprints seem to be getting bigger and brighter as more and more cameras and internet of things and gizmos and connectivity continues to expand. So we are not only data creators and data consumers, but we also influence data quality. For example, we choose how honest we're gonna be. 
at the doctor's office or at your company if they do a health questionnaire. It's likely that you reported a little less in terms of the donuts or the vaping or the weight on your scale. Because a majority of people underreport the things that are unhealthy. We also choose whether we're going to uh, provide our data. We're getting so tired of surveys. Everybody wants you to rate them. But it's hard to keep on doing it. And now we have ways to keep from having to answer those surveys. So 20 years ago, 90% of households could be reached. Now it's a lot fewer and I couldn't even find the last 10 years, but even in between 96, 97 and 2012, the response rate has declined from one in three to one in 10. And I think it's way smaller now. Then we also decide what we're going to tell people about ourselves. And I hear a lot of HR folks who are, think they are doing a great job of hiring, only to have Business in, Insider do some surveying of their own. And seven out of 10 people said they embellished or misrepresented information on their resume. So we are data consumers, data creators, data manipulators. And we are also evaluators. And so we have to choose what we're going to believe about any given data point or data set. So we evaluate things, for example, if you're like me and you go on Amazon, you decide you're going to look at the reviews to see what other people said. Well, it turns out there's a whole business about providing good reviews. For $259, you can go to Use Viral and you can get 55 star reviews on your Google website. So we're evaluating, but we're wondering how good these pieces of information are. We evaluate whether or not things are fair. At one of the companies that I work with, the company decided that there were too many fives on the one to five scale of company performance, and they really needed it to get adjusted back to a normal curve so that the majority of people are threes, regardless of whether you had an underperforming or highly performing team. And so, Many people who had been a five every time were now a four or a three, and they were told, it's okay, your rating went down, but it really doesn't mean anything. So there was a lot of pushback and angst and concern because data was about them and they needed to figure out what the meaning was behind the change. Lastly, example, I was on a jury where the accused defendant had DNA that matched DNA found um, at the sign at the scene of the actual crime. The chances that that was the same person that uh, was one in 10 billion that it could have matched to somebody else. Pretty convincing to me understanding DNA. But there was a fellow juror who said, how can they possibly know something like that? Because they don't understand DNA. So we spend time evaluating things. Sometimes we do it well, sometimes we don't do it well, but we are all every day consumers. We are evaluators, we are influencers, and we spend a lot of time interacting with data. So 
We already use and evaluate data all the time. How do we translate that into literacy? Well, first let's review what we think literacy means because there's a lot of definitions out there. And according to Accenture, depending on which of their surveys you look at, it's that three, four out of five or as many as nine out of 10 are not confident that they have the skill to read, write, or communicate with data. But it's kind of a big hurdle that we are talking about to define what data literacy means. Even Dataversity in June of 22 had a definition in one of the articles that was posted that said not only to read, write, and communicate with data, but also do so in context, including an understanding of data sources, constructs, analytic methods, techniques, and the ability to describe the use case application and resulting value. That is a pretty heavy lift in terms of what we want for literacy. In addition, Michael Larson, who is often quoted in the area of literacy, he believes that you should know which data are appropriate for answering questions, be able to read charts and graphs in order to interpret data, to understand the path from source to visualization, to know how to represent it uh, based on what analysis you did, to recognize biased and misleading data sets, and have the ability to communicate who pe with people who may not be as literate as they are. Again, this is a lot that we are asking. How do we achieve greater and greater levels of literacy and decide which of these parts we want to emphasize? And probably the most elaborate definition is from data to the people. Their 15 data abilities are listed here, all the way between understanding and manipulating to uh, converting and curating, then analyzing, interpreting, and presenting. And they have six levels where they hope that we can get more and more people up to level four or five or six. So when we think of it in this global context, it can feel kind of daunting, at least it does for me. And I have to ask all of you to spend just a second here. I wanna ask you, how long did it take you to learn all of the things you wish everyone knew about data. Now, I want you to really think about it. How long did it take you? I remember in graduate school when I had my fourth or fifth semester of statistics, I realized that even though I had gotten high grades in my earlier semesters, I really hadn't grasped the nuances of how to look at information and understand what significance and variance really indicate. So for me, it took quite a while to really absorb. So now I want you to take what you think was how long it took you and think about how possible it is to condense that. I looked online for a variety of online literacy courses. And this is what their duration and complexity involves. One is 80 minutes with eight quizzes on your way to literacy. One is 16 hours to literacy. One is 12 lessons and 12 group discussions. One is three free YouTube videos and you will be literate. One is five hours with one exam and then you are fully certified. 
One was 50 hours plus a project, and then they guaranteed mastery. One is ongoing 30 minutes once a week for lunch. And there's an executive course for $6,000, seven weeks, 28 hours of work to now be literate. So it makes me wonder when I look at those things and I think about how I have learned about data in the past. Is this a situation where it's one and done? You take a course, eight, 80 minutes and eight quizzes, five hours, one exam. Is it one and done? Or is it something that we have to do over and over and add a little bit each time to understand what is happening? Another question is, how do we make it more relevant? The executive course said that they focus that entire seven weeks on one particular problem, which was the effects of COVID on corporate policy, which is probably an interesting one and has a lot of nuances. And it's um, fascinating for the leaders to actually look through. We also see other groups trying to make it fun by doing things like uh, comparing lyrics in popular songs. This one exercise was which of these three artists, Kanye, Jay-Z, or Katy Perry, was the most based on what words I, me, my, or their name compared to you. And then they looked at frequencies of different words for Beyonce's lyrics. So how often they used various words or sounds, O-O-O is, is uh, not really words. And for those of you who like her to the left, to the left, everything you own in the box to the left, she used that 80 times. So we can make things interesting and fun how might we make people care? What is it that really makes people care about a topic, about data? And I'm gonna take us in a slightly different direction and say, what if we make literacy personal? And what I mean by that is if we look at individual performance, if we are measuring things about you, you care a lot more than if it's about something hypothetical. So, think about these statements if I said them to you. Your sales revenue was next to last among the sales team. You saw fewer patients in the last week than anyone else in the practice. You completed fewer projects than other team members. Customer satisfaction was down this month in your group compared to last month. And turnover is higher at your facility than other facilities. If you're like me and it's pointed at me, and I use negative examples here, but the same thing could be if I told you you were the best or saw the most and completed more projects than anybody else. It's personal and it matters more to you. So I'm gonna talk about three things that help make data relevant. The first is when there is something of value at stake. So the first possibility is money. If you bet on a sport event, it matters more to you than if you're just watching. If your reputation or recognition is at stake, if you're hoping to win a prize or be the best. 
opportunities. When you perform well enough that people consider you for promotion or for other types of activities. And choice. There is value in having choice about what you're going to do next. When I trust you to do what you want to do, there is a value in that. And so when we think about this, we can think about whether or not in a person's job, bonuses are the number one motivator for people to pay attention, but also awards, recognition, earning extra time off, or bragging rights even. If there are things that can make it more relevant and more valuable to the individual, even if they feel like now I'm safe because I'm one of the best performers. So if we go through a downturn, I'm not going to be the one who loses my job. Anything that puts value in the hands of the individual helps it become more relevant. Number two, it's more relevant if it's something that I can influence. So if there is some aspect of what I'm doing that we can reward, for example, how much I get done, how well I do it, how quickly I get it done, or how long I last, the endurance that I have so that I keep going. So is there something that you do as a worker that can be changed by you so that you do more, do better, do faster, do longer? And that influence comes from something under your control, like how much time you spend, the effort you give, the attention that you pay, the experience that you acquire, the new learning that you invest in. If you can influence an outcome based on that investment, it becomes even more relevant to you. And lastly, there are measurable concerns that become relevant if the other two things are there. If there's something at value at stake and it's something you can influence, then you are gonna have concerns if there are things that might interfere with your metric. For example, measurement amb ambiguity, and I will get into exactly examples of that. If we aren't measuring consistently across people, then how can you compare us? If there is inequality in opportunities, for example, then that's a concern. If I don't have control over what it is that I'm doing, that's a concern. And if it's a moving target. So I think I'm supposed to be doing X, but actually I am being asked to do Y. So, why bring up these things about relevance? Well, because it focuses people both from the standpoint of performance, but also helps them understand data. Because the more something is at stake, the more I can influence it, then the more attention I am going to pay to whether the data are reliable, whether they're fair, and whether or not there are issues in the way. So I'm gonna talk about a concept called line of sight. And if you haven't heard it, it has to do with how we connect a person and their job to the company goals. If you study organizational development and performance, you will hear that an, any individual needs to have a line of sight between what their job is and how the company succeeds. 
if the person can't see from what they're doing and how to prioritize what they're doing to the company goals, you have a hard time um, keeping them on task and a hard time helping them feel like they are a part of the overall mission. So let's do an example. This is a very um, highly referenced study uh, from 2000 that was conducted by a windshield replacement company. And the windshield replacement company knew that they wanted to grow and achieve sustained growth, which meant lowering cost per replacement, replacing more windshields, teams operating efficiently, avoiding rework, and absolutely for the individual, their job is to replace windshields quickly and efficiently. So their intervention was to switch from an hourly wage to a pay per install. So for every unit that a worker successfully replaced, they uh, got a certain amount of pay. The reason why this is quoted so much is that it's a very clear example of variable pay or pay per, for, for performance, which increased their productivity by 44%, just simply from changing how people were compensated. And the individuals, depending on how fast they worked and how well they did, um, had earnings that were between 10 and 28% higher. A net win for the company and also a win for the workers. However, if we look at all of these different things, what's at stake, what I can influence and what the concerns were. Money was at stake because individual workers could make more. They tracked their own performance, understanding how many windshields they replaced, how quickly they did it. But there was a concern because there was ambiguity about what constituted a successful install to get paid. And so what happened was there were people who were really, really fast who ended up having faulty installs that had to come back. So they had to revise how they uh, categorized it and also revised how people were assigned work because if a windshield came back, they had to redo it. That same worker had to redo it in order to um, make it fairer to those who were doing high quality installs. But if we think about this from a data perspective, there were daily reports on how well they did. There were daily reports about how many had to be redone. There were daily reports about time and about um, how people performed. So it gave them opportunities to help people get more comfortable with the data that they had, more comfortable reviewing what was happening. Let's talk about another job, which is NFL football players. They have almost $400 million at stake based on individual performance bonuses in their contracts. They are very incentivized to do specific aspects of performance. So let's first look at wide receivers. If their team wants to win a Super Bowl, they need to make the playoffs which means they have to win games, which means that they need to score touchdowns, which means they need to gain more total yards and the receiver needs to have more receptions. You can bet 
that they understand exactly how many they have. They understand exactly how many more yards they need. Because, for example, one receiver gets gets $100,000 for reaching each of these milestones in terms of yards and each of these milestones in terms of the number of receptions. This one's pretty straightforward, but you better believe they pay attention to the data. Well, what about defensive linemen? Again, the team wants to go to the Super Bowl, make the playoffs, win games, but they have to stop the other team from getting touchdowns, stop the other team from gaining yards and have sacks and tackles. Again, one of the leading defensive linemen can get up to a million dollars for 10 sacks in a season. But if we look at all of the things that they have concerns about, you can imagine they know exactly how many tackles they've had because there is money at stake. They know that it's based on how many they do and how many snaps and opportunities they have. But what do you do when you have a quarterback that is really good at being rushed and throwing it out of bounds? Do I get credit for those? What if I get put in only against the best offensive lines and somebody else gets to play in games where the person is, um, where the front line is, uh, offensive front line is not as good. So as they start to look at data, they realize what they can influence and they begin to start to understand the ambiguity in the data that they have. So if we look at this idea of line of sight, and I've heard of people providing reports for nurses, not because they get a bonus, but because they're trying to understand the division of labor. They're trying to understand who is good at which aspects of the job so that people can track their own work. Another example is a company that I worked for. We did data analysis and um, data management for companies. And we were able to put in a performance bonus for analysts in a way that we could achieve a team goal of earning more revenue from analytics. But to do that, we had to increase turnaround, increase the speed and quality, make sure that we're assigning the work really quickly and that the analysts themselves are accepting the work and completing the work um, in a really timely fashion. So how did they do that? Well, what they did was they took a portion of the revenue and set it aside for bonuses. And the bonuses were split based on how well they did, each of the analysts did and volunteered to take on the various jobs. So this instant that it comes in, then people could, uh, could volunteer to do that particular project based on what they were doing then. But they quickly realized that there was there needed to be a degree of difficulty assigned to each of the projects. And it was based uh, not only on difficulty, but the number of hours that it was going to take. So the analysts understood what was at stake in terms of money? What was at stake in terms of increased opportunity um, within the organization? They knew they could influence it, not only by how well they did, but also things that they learned so that they could take on higher value projects. And they understood that there, by looking at the data, some people were getting more or fewer of these opportunities. And they had to learn how to qualify for bigger opportunities. I know that analysts aren't people that need better data literacy, but it's just one more example of how we can make data relevant to 
every worker in some way. So what I am proposing is that if you are running a data literacy project, then can you measure something about the team that you are teaching? Can you measure how well they're doing by customer satisfaction or quality of output? Can you measure how much they're doing? Can you measure how fast they're getting it done or their endurance? If you can measure those things, can you create some sort of a valuable outcome for them? Can you say there is a bonus? Can you make sure that that line of sight is there so that they realize they can get the recognition for employee of the month by achieving what they need to achieve or that they get another opportunity to do something different or they're given a choice about something valuable for them. Because as you measure these things and report them back, they will bring up concerns about whether or not they're being told they should do A or B and maybe they're getting measured on B, but they still have to do A. So it's a moving target. Maybe what you're measuring is ambiguous and there needs to be more clarity. Maybe they're not being allowed to, to spend the time on the things that they want to spend the time on. Maybe some people are getting different opportunities depending on what office they work in or um, what sorts of projects are coming their way. So you can use this as a way to help them understand measures, what's typical, what's atypical, what does a distribution of those look like? Where do you fall on that? And then they can help you understand what they believe are the factors that are influencing their ability to be successful, but only if there is something at stake. So let's think about these statements that I said. Your total sales revenue was next to last. The salespeople may say, well, look, you know, you have me in this sales division and our product mix is different than the other sales division. They will provide you with information about what isn't right with the metric. If you ask doctors, let them know that they saw fewer patients, they will tell you, well, I had more difficult patients with more illnesses and I needed to spend more time with them. So we need to control for how sick somebody is, how many chronic illnesses they have. You completed fewer projects. Well, how are we gauging the difficulty of those projects? And customer satisfaction was down. Well, what other factors seem to influence that? Did we have a bunch of people who were out from work so that our response time was slower? What other factors? And they can tell you how they might want to use data differently because it matters to them. So the three things are a meaningful outcome relevant to the way that they do work and what is helpful to them. Is it money? Is it choice? Is it opportunity? Is it recognition? Can you develop a meaningful outcome? Even if it's just that they know they are the best or they know that they need to improve. What specific metrics are available that they can influence? Is it how well they do, how much they do, how fast they do it, how ha much happier their clients are? What is the metric that they can influence? And then have them help you understand the qualifiers, the control variables, the covariates 
that help to make it fair in a way that they begin to understand the data better. So our goal here is that we develop a system to educate people about data using data that means the most to them, using the line of sight from their job to company goals. And what we hope is that even if they're not jumping up and down, they start to see that more data equates to more success for them. So I will stop there. Thank you so much, Wendy. And we've got some some interesting questions in in chat, and and, and some interesting questions in Q and A as well. Um, in Q and A, we've got one of my favorite questions, which is very much tangentially related to uh, to this talk, is uh, how can data literacy teams engage busy executives in developing their data literacy skills? What are some effective time efficient strategies you would recommend for making data literacy learning access accessible and appealing to the C-suite without requiring a major time commitment from them? And I think well, you and I, Wendy, have talked about this at length previously as well, yes, <laughs> like just yes. personally. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, it's, it's an important topic and um, you won't always be able to convince them. But I would say that this line of sight topic is about as relevant as you can get for executives. So they don't wanna learn literacy based on some metric that isn't important to them. But if you can show various uh, parts of the business and how they are performing relative to the overarching goals. So for example, every executive has their own KPIs, key performance indicators that they are being held to by the CEO or by their board. They have something to achieve and it probably is something that has been announced and clear that they need to achieve growth, that they need to achieve um, better safety, that they need to achieve lower turnover. So if you can bring them information that helps them do their job by providing data and then explaining to them, oh, by the way, here is how we assign something as typical. Here is how we assign something as an outlier. Here is what a relationship between these two things looks like. And here are the things that you might want to control for so that you better understand their influence on your success. So I would make data literacy um, form to what they need to hear rather than asking them to pay attention to the data that we use as an education tool. I love that. I love that, uh, uh, that point. Uh, well, very well said. Are there data literacy frameworks you would recommend? I'm asking since it would be best to customize such training to something that is meaningful to local context, something that may not be possible with generic training. Yeah, um, I, I think that there are quite a few trainings out there that, that uh, cover the basics well. And I mean, we saw there are, you know, three videos free on YouTube or, you know, 10 classes. You can take those um, lessons and maybe one lesson is on central tendency. One lesson is on variance. One lesson is on, um, you know, how you make comparisons and take the lesson, but apply it to 
the line of sight of the people that you are working with. Now, what's interesting is there will be sometimes people will say, well, I don't even know what the line of sight is for that job. That's a problem <laughs> for the company <laughs> that's bigger than literacy. But assuming that you can line it up, what metrics could you use that are absolutely tied to that person's success? Because that's how you make it matter to them. I love that too. And and as soon as you said that, Wendy, the the line from Office Space popped into my head where where the the consultants are there and they ask, what is it you say you do here? <laughs> <laughs> that would be that line of sight. And we we have actually a, a, a good segue question here in, in, in the QA. For an organization that is committed to providing data literacy trainings by a learning platform, how would you consider to pivot? to a line of sight per team? Is this session-based, survey-based, having documentation on data products and analytical products fully complete, all of this? Yeah, um, so I'm assuming what this means is that you have sort of, um, you've taken an outside course and applied it and had that universal message hoping that the data that they're using are interesting enough so that everybody will take the course. Um, and, you know, sometimes in a large organization, you have to decide that that's what you're going to do. But what you might want to also do is maybe a few interactive sessions in addition that are focused directly on the line of sight the um, job. So but you get together with all of the, you know, front end, the, the checkers, you know, who are at the checkout counter, you get together with all of the, um, the operators in the warehouse, you get together with all of the, um, you know, folks who answer the phones. And after they have achieved, you know, sessions A, B, and C on the online, you tailor it then to their job to make it real. And so you're not doing all of the education, you're just adding some application so that it's an ongoing thing. And, and think about a report that they get all the time because that's the other part of this. The one and done really is tough. So once they get through that education, they may, um, you know, then great, I've checked the box, but that doesn't necessarily keep me thinking about how it's relevant to me. Mm -hmm. um, I see this next question. Um, is, it, is there more to be gained from in-person literacy training than virtual? I would think that helps with engagement and networking and caring about the data. Um, to the degree that it is feasible, yes, I do. Um, and it doesn't need to be, uh, it can be live, you know, virtual live. And um, it can also, like I said, tag on to um, some recorded education so that they're getting the basic um, concepts, but then they're asked to bring themselves, you know, and their thinking to these sessions that have to do with the uh, complexity of measures that are um, influencing their job and their performance. There was a, a, a lot of discussion in chat about the overall data quality of various metrics and KPIs. And, and in, I know in my past, when working with teams implementing variable pay solutions, if there were data quality issues uh, that impacted somebody's bonus or commission or, or so on, uh, we'd often get um, um, data contributors uh, tracking their own <laughs> their, their own data and then challenging the, the results every pay period. Um, and, and and I saw a lot of back and forth in in chat talking about that. And personally, I always felt it as a as a way to 
uh, get traction on resolving some data quality issues. But uh, what are your thoughts on on something like that, Wendy? The pay for performance always is fraught um, because um, that third box, there are always ambiguities, inequities. Um, I mean, other than the the auto glass replacement, which is about as clean as you can get. I mean, you either replaced it or you didn't, and someone either came back and complained or they didn't. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, and most of our jobs are not like that. But if we communicate in the right way, and if it is implemented um, and communicated as, we are gonna do our best to make this as fair as possible, it may evolve as we get better at this. We um, want to have discussions about what you think is fair or not fair about it. But our underlying goal is to reward the people who are achieving the most. That is our underlying goal, is we want to reward you for a job well done. And we want to have you pay attention to the things that matter most to the organization, hence the line of sight. But we will have discussions about it and we can have uh, revisions if there is evidence that it's not working the way that we would like it to work. But I have seen it work in things like consulting. I've seen it work in other areas where you, you do know that um, Mark worked way harder than Wendy did. And everybody can tell that Mark worked way harder than Wendy did. And whether that's a, you know, a four versus a two or a five versus a one, um, that can be debated, but usually people do get it on an ordinal basis. Um, so yeah, it is, it, I'm not saying it's easy. But I'm saying that it is extremely valuable, and I and I think that literacy could gain tremendous amount from having that as a focus. Yeah, and I really like your message as to um, having that line of sight and and really tying it to something tangible that's a company goal. So that's that's my big takeaway from from today's session for sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I do really think that. Um, we are missing a dual opportunity. And actually it's a triple opportunity because I think that um, executives would get behind it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because everybody's excited about promoting what the company is supposed to be doing and, and tying to a strategic goal somehow and and right. uh, having that line of sight based on the individual players. I love your um, NFL example because that's, uh, very clear and easy to understand for, especially for us sports nuts. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, it was interesting because it put, took me off on this whole tangent of looking up. If you make a, a great, re if you make a reception in the end zone and then it gets called back because somebody else was holding, do you necessarily lose the count of the reception? And I can't find that. But if I'm a receiver, I'm going to be really ticked off. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think you see you, that on the field too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, or if um, you get a sack, but it's with two other people, so you get half a sack. And you know, there were there was one example where a, a receiver a receiver needed four more yards to get another hundred thousand dollars or something. And oh his agent told him that in the fine print, um, if somebody lateral to him, and it was the last game of the season, the last quarter, the last set of downs, if somebody received and then lateral to him, it would count. <laughs> oh my so, gosh. so <laughs> he was running down the sideline asking everybody if they would please lateral to him. So, <laughs> so, I mean, it does make it matter. I mean, it really does make it matter. So, oh, that's great. 
Well, thank you, Wendy, for this great session uh, and, and q and I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Uh, just to remind everybody, we will be posting the recorded webinar and slides to Dataversity within a couple of business days, and we will send out a follow-up email to let you know the links to other any other requested information. Thank you again for today's webinar, and I hope everybody has a wonderful day. Great. Thanks, everybody.